Make this the best Halloween ever by pre-ordering my two brand new books coming out soon. The first is Phantom Phenomena, a hand-picked collection of the all-time scariest stories I've ever received, accompanied by atmospheric illustrations and field notes. Then there's Appalachian Folklore, an extraordinary catalog of the chilling history, creepy folklore, and rich culture of the Appalachians. These release October 15th and 8th, respectively. Pre-order now on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. But hurry, because the first 100 pre-orders to verify via the link in the description or at eeriecast.com slash verify will receive an exclusive hoodie and hardcover copy of Lore, a folklore horror novel. When the biggest, toughest dog you've ever met starts running from something in the woods, you'd better start running too. Welcome back to Alone in the Woods. I'm Darkness Prevails, here to share with you scary eyewitness stories that happened in the great outdoors. Today's episode is a fun and terrifying one, featuring stories from all around the world, and a few of these tales are arguably some of the better ones I've heard in quite a while. Enjoy. If you have a scary story that happened outdoors, send it to me at eeriecast.com outdoor so I can read it on the show. If you like what you hear, Help us reach more listeners by leaving us a rating or review on Spotify and Apple, and subscribe to Darkness Prevails on YouTube. Thank you. Now, throw a log on the fire, because the night is still young. What the Dog Saw From Enda Spirit World When I was a kid, I was an outdoorsman as was my friend Larry, who lived nearby. We lived in a rural area, with lots of opportunities for that sort of thing. Across the street from our homes was a huge tract of timber, where we would hunt whatever was in season, or go camping and fishing at other times. My friend and I knew of a small private lake too, about 15 acres in size, located two miles through the woods from our houses. One night, we set out to gig some frogs for frog legs. The neighbor's huge dog, Bozo, so named for his giant feet, came along with us. When we were about a mile into the woods, we had what I've always felt was a supernatural experience. Off to our right, about 30 feet away, there appeared a blue glowing orb several feet in diameter. It seemed quite bright, but it didn't illuminate the surroundings like a normal light would. It reflected off nothing. The night was just as dark as it had been, deep in that black pine forest. We all stopped in our tracks, and Bozo gave a deep, rumbling growl. It was somewhat comforting to have Bozo there with us. He was mostly Great Dane and weighed more than a hundred pounds. We walked on, maybe another hundred yards, and the light appeared again. This time, Bozo didn't make a sound. He bolted back for home in a blind panic. We could hear his big feet drumming against the ground and the crashing sounds as he slammed into trees and tore through brush, heedless of injury in his urgent quest to get anywhere else. As you can imagine, this did wonders for our confidence. We decided at once that we too should be elsewhere. Thus began our retreat, at a slower pace but with just as much desire to be out of those woods as Bozo had. There was something with us. We could hear it out there, keeping pace. We'd both brought flashlights to spot frogs, but the normally bright beams faded as soon as we turned them on, as if the batteries were already almost dead. We turned them off to save power, only switching them on when the accompanying footsteps, bipedal, got too close. Even with the weak light, we saw nothing in the gloom. I had a twenty-two pistol for snakes, and I gripped it with white knuckles. There was nothing to shoot. Twice as we walked, we heard the sound of someone running up behind us. We whirled around, switching on our lights, only to find empty darkness. My skin crawled constantly, and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. The feeling of being watched of a malignant presence, was intense. The temptation to run blindly away as Bozo had done was always there, like a heartbeat. Once, 
something touched my shoulder, like a hand had been laid lightly on it, and I yelped. Dang it, Larry said. Something just pulled on my shirt. We're going, I yelled into the darkness. Leaving, just lay the heck off and we'll be gone. We stumbled on, knowing the road must be close by now. The pressure, the hatred, seemed to diminish with each step, and we began to see the glimmer of yard lights through the trees. We burst through the brush line and out into the open air of the roadway. Bozo came running to meet us, wagging his ridiculous tail like a whip. He'd waited for us there out in the open. He was worried about us, just not worried enough to stay out there in those haunted woods with us. I've always wondered what it was, what the dog saw. Almost Tiger Food From J. Ion My friend was born and raised in Bangladesh, specifically in the capital city of Dhaka. She left to study abroad when she finished high school, as did most of her extended family, with many of them choosing to settle permanently in the USA, UK, and UAE. Despite the separation, they remain in frequent contact with each other and made annual visits to their home country. In 2013, it just so happened that all the family members based abroad were visiting Dhaka at the same time, which never happened before. My friend's dad, who always played host to returning relatives, is somewhat of a leader of the clan. He decided that on this rare occasion of having the entire family back on home soil, they should all go on a holiday together to a local tourist attraction, specifically to the famous Sunderbonds, a large national park that is home to the endangered Bengal tigers. He booked a resort village to accommodate 23 people for five days, within the vicinity of the Sunderbond National Park, and had each day's itinerary planned with a local tour company. They all enjoyed the trip very much, especially because the peaceful and pristine forests of the Sunderbonds proved to be a wonderful relief from the never-ending, overcrowded, polluted hustle and bustle of the capital city. On the fourth day, the more senior family members wanted to take another walk through the forest trails, before they had to leave the following morning. By the time they made the request with the local tour company for four strangers to guide them on this walk, it was around the late afternoon on a Thursday. Because Bangladesh is an Islamic country, Fridays recognize the first day of the weekend, due to it being considered a sacred day. So many people will be winding down from Thursday evening onwards. What this meant was, Instead of having at least two armed rangers guide the group, as per the recommendation by safety experts, the tour company managed to secure just one armed ranger who was willing to guide the walk on such short notice. My friend and her entire family were completely unaware of this safety recommendation then, so they happily got ready for the walk. By the time they were halfway through the forest walk, the sun was starting to set, the ranger had walked at the very front of the group with the more senior family members, while the younger ones were trailing behind, all of them distracted by their chatting amongst each other, and not realizing the distance they were creating from the safety of the ranger's guns. My friend felt her stomach rumble, very softly at first. Thinking it was slight hunger pangs or her weak constitution randomly acting up, she ignored it and kept walking while chatting. Just a minute later, she felt the stomach rumblings getting stronger, and something like vibrations from under the lungs. A few seconds afterwards, she felt the vibrations spread to her neck and ears, an odd sensation which she had never experienced before. And this was when she heard a very faint growl, like an angry animal snarling from within a closed crate. She looked around but saw nothing unusual in the dim light of dusk. She asked her cousins if they heard something, to which they shook their heads and replied that they had not. But then they all heard it, a very distinct and guttural growl, almost like it was building itself into a roar. 
It came from somewhere in the undergrowth of the forest, causing the trees and forest floor to visibly tremble. They immediately sprinted as quickly as humanly possible towards the direction of the ranger. They'd been so slow in their walk, they didn't realize the ranger and the rest of the family were nearly one kilometer ahead of them, so the ranger and family couldn't hear nor see any of the commotion. The entire time that they were running for safety, my friend said she could hear the growls getting louder with each second. She was praying that they weren't being stalked, because no human could outrun a tiger, especially in the diminishing light of the evening, in the tiger's home turf no less. When they saw the ranger, they yelled at him to hold his gun up and aim behind them. The ranger looked confused and yelled back at them to stop fooling around. My friend's cousin screamed at the ranger. There's a tiger following us! Shoot it! Now! The ranger held his rifle up, aiming up at the sky, and fired a warning shot. Everyone quickly huddled behind the ranger, including my friend and her cousins who sprinted right behind their elders. With his gaze still on the forest, he yelled at everyone to get to the end of the trail and get out of the forest. The ranger walked backwards slowly, rifle pointing at the forest until he got to a safe spot with everyone else. Once all of them were in the safety of a shelter, they told the ranger what happened. The ranger was stunned. This is when they learned that the tiger was in fact crouching only 10 meters from where they were standing, based on the strength of the growl and the vibrations. My friend who had felt her body rumbling actually was experiencing very low frequency growls that are used as a sort of warning by tigers. The most surprising part of their encounter was this. Any tiger within 10 meters of prey or predator would have pounced. At that short of a distance, a tiger would have chosen to eliminate a threat directly, then leave things to chance. They were miraculously fortunate to have encountered a rather patient tiger who didn't feel like leaving its hiding spot at that time. Needless to say, they were very relieved to leave the next morning. They breathed a collective sigh of relief when they were within sight of the city. As much as they enjoyed the majority of their family holiday, they were too shaken up by this close encounter. Funnily enough, just a few weeks before this family trip, the Life of Pi novel by Jan Martel was made into a movie. I joked that she could have befriended Richard Parker, but unfortunately she is not Pi in the open sea. She didn't find my joke amusing. The Stalker That Wouldn't Leave From Miss Eleven A few years ago in the south of England, I decided to go for a walk in one of the local forests with my friend Jay and his dog, who was a black cocker spaniel. These walks soon became a regular occurrence, we followed the main paths for about 45 minutes before deciding to venture deeper into the woodland. As we entered the area with tall, thin trees, an eerie feeling crept over us, as if we were being watched. A few minutes after, we came upon a fence topped with barbed wire, with a field on the other side and more woods continuing beyond it. We stopped at the fence, and Jay's dog froze staring at something across the field. A couple of seconds after noticing the dog's strange behavior, we heard a laugh drifting on the wind. This wasn't a normal laugh. It was a wicked, eerie cackle. Jay and I turned to face each other in sync, both wearing the same confused expression. There was no one else around. We were deep in the forest, far from any other people. We looked back across the field and spotted a tall figure, about six foot eight, with red hair, yellow overalls, and a pale face, staring right back at us. Jay's dog hadn't moved, still fixated on whatever it was. Without saying a word, Jay and I both reacted the same way. We took off running, with the dog following close behind. 
We ran for about five to ten minutes, not stopping for anything, until we were finally out of breath. We slowed down just off the main path to catch our breaths and process what had just happened. As we sat there trying to calm down, we began to hear a rustling in the bushes and that same eerie laugh again. Without hesitation, we decided to head back to our cars and just leave. A couple of weeks later, we went on another walk with Jay's dog, but this time we chose a different location, about eight or nine kilometers away from the last forest. It was a cold winter morning, and we met up around 7.45 a.m., bundled up in gloves, hats, and winter coats. This time we stuck to the main paths for the entire walk. We had completed about a third of the route when that uneasy feeling returned like we were being followed. Both Jay and I caught flashes of red and yellow in the corners of our eyes, but we dismissed it as our minds playing tricks on us. That was until we were about five minutes away from the car park. We heard that eerie cackle again from our previous walk, and I thought I saw a white face peeking out from the trees. Ever since these two encounters, Jay and I have felt like we are constantly being watched or followed whenever we're out in the wilderness, no matter where we are. One night I went over to Jay's house for dinner, and I ended up staying the night. While helping him clean up after dinner, we saw a tall, shadowy figure in his backyard. The figure was human-shaped, but quite tall, and there were no neighboring yards close enough for it to have been anyone else. We immediately thought of that same thing we had seen before. We've tried researching local folklore or other sightings, but we haven't found anything. This remains an unsolved mystery. I've since moved away, but Jay still claims to have seen this figure and continues to feel watched. Whenever I return to visit, I get that same feeling too. I hope to God, whatever this creature is, it doesn't harm my friend or his dog whenever I'm not there. My first and hopefully last Wendigo encounter. From James 54 2. I'm 28 years old and living in Texas. This is my story. Back in 2019, there was a lot of talk about unknown creatures roaming the forests. Things like Bigfoot and even Skinwalkers. But this story isn't about them. This tale is about probably one of the scariest things I've ever heard of. The Wendigo. A few months after one of my friends named Jacob mentioned the uproar, I went to see him. I'd been away, enlisted in the United States Marines, and I'd just been discharged. One of the first things I did was go to visit him. We were having a great time when he brought up the idea of going out to a little hangout spot his ex-girlfriend had taken him to when they wanted to get away for a few hours. I figured why not, so I grabbed my gun and we headed out to this extremely secluded area where there was an old dock. The place looked abandoned, poorly maintained, with some boards nearly rotted through. About half an hour into our shenanigans, Jacob brought up the topic of the Wendigo. The name itself gave me a chill, even being a Marine. Curious, I asked him about it. He told me that if you went into the woods and said Wendigo three times, you would come across the scariest thing you'd ever see. Thinking he was bluffing, I told him to prove it. To this day, I wish I hadn't we started to walk down a narrow path that led deep into the thick woods near the Alabama state line. We walked for maybe 20 minutes and decided we were finally in a good spot. It's worth noting that it had been raining heavily the past few days, so the ground was completely saturated. Jacob dared me to say it. I stood there in complete silence. The rest of the forest was eerily quiet, save for the tall pines swaying in the wind above our heads. Reluctantly, I started to say it. 
Wendigo. 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 Then, nothing happened. I let out a sigh of relief. In the ten years Jacob and I had been friends, this was one of the few times I had proven him wrong. We started laughing and talking trash to each other when we suddenly heard a noise in the distance. Reflexes kicking in, I immediately snapped towards the sound, which was soon joined by others. I moved closer and moments later, we saw a few coyotes running across the path about 30 feet in front of us. Another sigh of relief, but that relief didn't last long. I had a gut feeling that something was off. As we turned to leave the woods, a tall pine tree began to groan and creak as it fell down. Acting on pure instinct, I shoved Jacob forward, just as the tree came crashing down between us. Jacob screamed as the tree hit the ground and I quickly jumped over it to get back to him. I could feel his heart pounding like a drum as I pulled him up to his feet. Still freaked out, he wasn't moving fast enough. I yelled at him. Move, Move Jacob! Jacob. Move, Move now. now! I spun him around, causing him to stumble and fall. I helped him back up and we both started to sprint down the path, back the way we'd came. Neither of us dared to look back. As we ran, I suddenly heard a familiar voice behind me. Jacob! Jacob, come quick! It was the voice of Jacob's younger sister, Olivia. Jacob immediately tried to run past me, screaming, Olivia! I grabbed him. Jacob, look at me. That is not her, do you hear me? That can't be her. Just then, another pine tree began to buckle. I tackled Jacob to the ground, and we narrowly avoided being crushed. I screamed at him again, Go, get out of here, now! As I shouted, I pulled a gun from my waistband and aimed it down the trail in the direction we'd come from. Jacob made it to the trailhead, turned back, and saw me still aiming my gun. Bradley, get out of there! Hurry! I turned and ran towards him. As I reached the clearing, about fifty feet ahead, Jacob and I both saw it. The thing we had dared to summon. A wendigo. It stood around nine feet tall on two legs, with barely any meat on its bones. Its legs were unnaturally skinny, and its arms were even skinnier. Its skin was pale white, almost like that of a vampire. But what stood out the most were its eyes, a vibrant blue, almost like lightsaber blue for those who have seen Star Wars. Overcome with fear, I raised my gun and fired at it. Jacob, not sticking around to see if I'd killed it, turned and ran for the car, and I followed close behind. That was my first experience with the so-called Wendigo, and I pray every night that I never encounter anything that terrifying again. In the Trees from Gallon 24. I've always hated the walk back from my friend's house. It's about a mile and a half of dark, empty road, with only two distant street lamps lighting the way. On either side, dense trees and thick forest loom like a wall of shadows. Every time I make that walk, I get this feeling in the pit of my stomach that something is watching me. I know it sounds stupid and cliche, but I simply can't shake it. My friends always offer to drive me home, but I usually decline. I guess I'm just stubborn like that. Anyway, this particular night, it was around 1am when I finally decided to head on home. We'd been playing video games and lost track of time. You know how it goes. I said my goodbyes and started the walk home. It was cold as heck that night and everything was just still, the kind of quiet where you can hear your own heartbeat. Every step I took, the crunch of my boots on the gravel road seemed to echo way louder than normal. The street lamps were so far apart 
casting these long stretches of darkness between them. I could feel my heart starting to race, even though I'd walked this road dozens of times before. It just felt different that night. I don't know how else to explain it. I was about halfway through the walk when I started to hear it. At first, it was so quiet, I thought I was imagining things. But the more I listened, the clearer it was. It was a soft, low noise, almost like a whisper or a hiss. You know how sometimes the wind through the trees can sound like voices? That's what I thought it was at first. But the more I listened, the more it sounded like, I'm not sure, like someone was trying to get my attention. I stopped walking and turned around, trying to see if I could spot anything in the tree line, but it was far too dark that night. My eyes couldn't make out much past the faint glow from the street lamp up ahead. I told myself I was just being paranoid, that it was all in my head, so I kept on walking, picking up the pace a little. Soon I heard it again, this time closer, way closer. It sounded like a low, raspy voice calling my name, or at least it was trying to. I felt my chest tighten up, and I had to force myself not to stop walking. I didn't want to look again, I just wanted to get home. But then, I don't know why, but something made me look up. Something in the trees caught my eye, and that's when I saw him. Clinging to the top branches of this old, tall pine tree, maybe fifty feet up in the air, was a man. He was pale and skinny, almost skeletal. His skin had this grayish tint to it, under the weak moonlight, and the way he was hanging there in the tree. It was like he was trying to hide, or maybe he was trying to scare me, not sure which is worse. But I could definitely see his eyes, they were wide open and unblinking and locked right onto me. I'd never felt so unsafe before. I froze for a moment. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe. I was so sure I was hallucinating. But then I saw him move. It was slow at first, really deliberate. He shifted his weight, and I could see his fingers gripping the branch as he lowered his body slightly. It hit me then. This man was preparing to jump. I still couldn't move. I had to see what was about to happen. In one quick motion, I watched this man jump from the tree. The sound he made when he hit the ground I'll never forget. It was this heavy thud, way louder than you'd expect from someone who looked so frail. That sound was what finally snapped me out of my stupor. I ran so fast, legs pumping like pistons, and I didn't stop to look back even once. The road felt like it went on forever, but I kept on going. My breath was ragged, and for a while there, all I could hear in my ears was my own heartbeat. I just wanted to get home, get to safety. By the time I reached my front door, I was gasping for air. I slammed the door behind me so hard, my parents came running. They were startled, demanding to know what was going on. I tried to explain what I'd seen, but the words weren't coming out right. My parents could see how freaked out I was. They called the police right away. The two officers showed up pretty quick, and I was able to lead them back to the exact spot where I'd seen the man fall. The whole way there, I could still hear the sound of that thud in my mind, still feel his eyes on me. But... When we got there, there was nothing. No sign of anyone. No footprints, no broken branches, no trace of the man I'd seen. The cops went ahead, searching the area thoroughly, but they found nothing out of place. They tried to reassure me, telling me what I was originally hoping it was, just my imagination, that I'd possibly mistaken a wild animal for a person in the dark but I knew what I saw. They weren't about to convince me otherwise. Back at the house, my parents made me apologize. I did, and went to bed, partially embarrassed but mostly terrified. The next few weeks were rough. I felt creeped out on that road, and I stopped walking along it, 
If I had to go to my friends, they would either have to pick me up or my parents would have to drop me off. Middle of the night, broad daylight, it doesn't matter. It's a pretty crazy story, and I've mostly gotten over it. But to this day, when I think about it, I get a chill down my spine. Who or what was that? I've always wondered if I watched an insane man kill himself in front of me, dying only after he dragged himself far enough away in the woods where the police wouldn't find him. Did it follow me? From Charlie Hall 765. Let me start by saying, my family has always had a knack for sensing spirits and other entities, especially my mother. She realized she had this ability when she was about 15, but that's a story for another time. This story begins back in the 90s when I was 11 years old. My mother, my older brother who was 13 at the time, and I lived way out in the boonies on a five-acre plot of land in central Indiana. Our house sat about 50 yards back from the road, and behind it was a two-story garage, a pond with a shed, and further back was an old wooden shack, with a patch of woods behind that to round out our property. When we first moved in, my mother told us to stay out of that shack. She said we'd been using it for excess trash or anything too big to put out by the road, and that raccoons and other animals would likely hang about there. So we didn't mess with it. We had plenty of land to roam and explore without needing to go near that shack. A little time passed after we moved in, and we started to experience typical ghostly encounters. Footsteps, gusts of wind where there shouldn't be, things like that. My mother told us not to worry, explaining that she believed it was just the ghost of a little girl who had drowned in that pond years back. She even gave her a name, Libby. Libby would do things that a typical little girl might do. Poke us, run around the corner and hide. It was all very playful, though it sometimes scared me because I was so young. But my mother always reassured me that everything was fine and that Libby was harmless. I only had one encounter where I actually saw Libby, and to this day that memory is burned into my head. It was about a year after we moved in. My cousin, Tyler, was over, and we were in the game room, playing GameCube. The game room had a big glass window that looked out onto the backyard and the pond. As we played, I happened to glance out the window and I saw what looked like a little girl, maybe around five years of age. She was standing under the pond light with her back to the house, just staring out at the water. She had jet black hair and was wearing a white dress with red polka dots and a little red bow in her hair. By this point, I'd experienced enough to know that if I looked away, there was a good chance she would disappear. So without taking my eyes off of her, I paused the game and told Tyler to get up and look. Now, Tyler didn't know anything about Libby. So when he saw the girl, he started to freak out, asking who she was and why she was out there in the middle of the night, where her parents were, and so on. All very reasonable questions. As he asked, the little girl slowly began to turn around to look at the house and just as I was about to see her face, boom, she disappeared. That was enough for us that night. We turned off the game, lay down, and put on a funny movie to help us fall asleep. Fast forward about a year. We had grown so used to Libby that she didn't bother us anymore. One summer day while my mom was at work, Tyler and I were outside fishing and catching garter snakes, just being adventurous. We decided that after living there so long without ever checking out the old shack, it was finally time for us to take a look. So we made the short hike back to the shack and went inside. There was some trash, but not as much as we expected. What we did find was an old wooden bed frame, a wooden dresser, and a little wooden baby crib that neither of us had ever seen before. 
They looked very old, almost handmade. Being the rambunctious teenage boys we were, we started to throw stuff around, breaking things and tearing it up. After we had our fun, we went back inside to get some drinks. When my mother came home from work, she barged through the front door, already yelling at us. She asked why we had been messing around in the shack and what we had done. At the time, we couldn't understand how she knew, since it had been hours ago, and she was in a different town. But she did know, and she was furious. We apologized and offered to clean it up, but she told us to leave it alone and stay in the house. After that day, we never heard or felt Libby again. I started to become really depressed and had trouble controlling my emotions. At first, I thought it was just puberty. But after a week or two, I began to feel like I was being watched and not in a protective kind of way. Every day, the feeling got worse. One night, I was lying in bed, watching TV, about to fall asleep. When I got that feeling again, like I wasn't alone, I looked over at the sliding closet door in my room. The door was broken and wouldn't close all the way, and as I looked, I saw a pair of red eyes. Not glowing, but dark, barely visible red eyes, just staring at me. There was no figure, no body, just eyes. It terrified me to the point that I started sleeping in the living room and refused to go into my bedroom. About six months later, we moved out of that house. It took my mother years to finally tell me what had happened and how she knew about the shack. She told me that from the very first day we moved in, she had sensed something evil connected to that shack. That's why she warned us to stay away. And when I'd gone out, destroying the bed frame and crib, whatever evil was in there moved into my bedroom. We moved because she was afraid of what was happening to me because of it. Looking back, I realize what happened. Now I'm telling this story because ever since we lived in that house, I've developed my own ability to sense these things. Every house I've lived in since has had continuous, unexplained paranormal activity. Even the house I live in now, 20 years later, as a grown man with children of my own. Every apartment, every house, every building I've lived in has had these issues. It makes me wonder, has whatever I angered as a child been following me all these years, tormenting me at every stop? Was there ever really a Libby? Or was it that thing posing as an innocent child to infiltrate our family and feed off our energy? I guess it's up to me to find out. Footsteps in the Dark From Tiny Goose For context, it was my first trip to Scotland. My boyfriend and I decided to spend Christmas in New York then fly across the pond to spend New Year's Eve in London. Since he has a bit of an obsession with Scotland, he insisted we spend a couple of days in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Word of advice, leave a little wiggle room in your plans. Due to a lack of planning, or maybe a few things going wrong, we ended up with no place to stay for a night in Edinburgh. We didn't think this would be a problem because we figured we could sleep at the bus station as we were supposed to catch a bus to Glasgow first thing in the morning. After a couple of drinks and a friendly couple offering us a place to crash, which we politely declined, not wanting to impose, we headed to the bus station. We were hauling two very big and very heavy suitcases. When we got to the station, we stashed our bags in the pay-to-use lockers and sat down, waiting for the night to pass. To give you more context, we're from Argentina, where most public spaces stay open all night long, so it came as quite a shock when we were told we couldn't spend the night at the station, even though our bus was scheduled for 6.30am. So yeah, next tip, do some contingency research. Next thing we knew, 
we were out on the streets of Edinburgh in the middle of January. After googling a few hotels that might accommodate us and finding no luck, there was some sort of sporting event and all the hotels were booked, we ended up wandering the streets of the city, which I do highly recommend if you have a place to stay afterward. We found ourselves on a very quiet, almost eerie road on the side of Calton Hill. There was a row of fancy houses uphill, interrupted by a path leading further into a dark, secluded forest area. Our reason for being there? A small, reasonably priced hotel at the end of the road. We wanted to check to see if they had any vacancy. When we reached the hotel, we were greeted by a tiny maisonette illuminated only by two old-fashioned lamps. We rang the bell and nothing happened. The sound of the bell interrupted the quiet, making us acutely aware of how lonely and isolated we were. We rang a second time, and we were about to ring a third when a withered, pale face appeared behind the window pane, staring back at us with a startled expression. The lady, who must have been around 80 years old, was wearing an old-fashioned pink gown, is this a hotel? We asked. Yes, she replied, surprised and almost offended by the question. Um, do you have any vacancies? No, she said, as if clutching her pearls, before promptly closing the small window and disappearing upstairs. And just like that, our hopes of sleeping indoors vanished. We headed back down the street, defeated. Let me set the scene. We were walking down this empty, eerie street illuminated only by a moonlight. To our left, the row of houses stretched toward Calton Hill. To our right, the road sloped downwards into an abyss of darkness. When we reached the end of the street, a small path crossed in front of us, leading to an almost medieval-looking church that gave me the heebie-jeebies. My imagination ran wild. Don't all old churches have creepy burial grounds around them? I was snapped out of my thoughts when my boyfriend, the wildlife enthusiast, thought that he saw a fox running across the road, heading up Calton Hill. Naturally, he did what any sane person would do. He ran after it to get a better look. We have foxes in Argentina, so he really didn't need to be doing this. But there he went, and of course, I followed. I admit I did want to see the fox too. The fox disappeared into a fenced-off, heavily wooded area, and we were left standing at the base of the dark and beautiful monstrosity that is Calton Hill at 3 a.m. The sight was breathtaking, and we even considered going up the hill to cross the town. Then we realized something strange. The wind had died down. No leaves rustling, no animals burrowing, no owls hooting, and certainly no fox. The silence was deafening, and the stillness made our skin crawl. How could it be this quiet? We were only a few hundred meters from the main road. For a split second, my heart skipped a beat, and the most horrendous thought crossed my mind. What if we were led here? I quickly brushed the thought aside, but the idea lingered. We were sitting ducks. We could easily be hunted, and no one would hear us scream. Another thought crossed my mind. My mom waving goodbye at the airport, saying, Please be safe. Please don't do anything stupid. Oh God, what would she think if they found my body out here? I turned to my boyfriend and asked, Honey, are there Wendigos in Scotland? He looked at me, confused by the sudden question. No, those are in North America, if they even exist. He paused. But I think they have Kelpies. What are those? I asked. They're said to be water horses that can shapeshift into human form to seduce you and lure you into bodies of water. Then they drown you and take you away. But I would hazard a guess we're safe here. There is no water around, he joked. The joke didn't comfort me at all. My train of thought was interrupted by the only sound we'd heard for a while. 
a deep, loud noise in the quiet night. No, not just the night. It came from the exact spot where the last slivers of moonlight met the dark tree line, less than two meters away from us. Rhythmic thuds, loud, heavy thuds, three of them, as if made by human footsteps wearing heavy metal-clad shoes. But the most terrifying part wasn't the sound. It was that the noise stopped. Someone or something was lurking in the dark just meters away from us, listening and watching, knowing we were alone and vulnerable. Whoever or whatever it was had waited until we were close, took three steps, and didn't move again. For a few seconds, we froze. This was the kind of situation my mother had warned me about. My boyfriend looked at me with terror in his eyes and whispered, Let's get out of here now. We ran. We ran like heck, all the way to Waverly Bridge, where we finally found a foul-smelling hostel to crash in. To this day, I still think about that night. What was it? Was it the fox shape-shifting into something larger and more menacing? Was it a drunk man trying to scare us, or maybe even hurt us? We may never know, but let me tell you this. Plan your trips in advance, and when your gut tells you to run, you'd better listen. The Thing in My Grandparents' Cottage From Marvin Martin This event took place in one of the villages up north on the Egyptian north coast, which, if you don't know, is a very popular summer destination. I was 16 when this happened. Every summer break since I was five years old, I would spend three months at my grandparents' house, so I was practically raised there and it felt like home. The layout of the cottage was simple. You walked in and to the left was the living room, with a wide window backed by shutters overlooking the street. In front of you was the dining room table, and to the right was a hallway with three bedrooms. My grandparents' room was first, followed by a second big bedroom, and at the end was my small single bedroom. Finally, at the very end of the hallway was the kitchen and back door. I had just finished the school semester, and like a typical teenager going through a rebellious phase, I wasn't thrilled about spending the summer with my grandparents. But tradition always won out, so I had to go. That didn't mean I wasn't going to stay out late with the friends I'd made over the years. My grandparents were strict about curfews, and I had to be back by 11 p.m., which I did. By that time, though, they were already asleep. That night, I came back and grabbed a snack from the fridge. I sat in the living room with the TV on mute, and after a while, I began to feel really sleepy. Knowing they would wake me up at 6 a.m. anyway, I decided it was time for bed, especially since I actually enjoyed my grandpa's breakfasts. I fell asleep in my humid bedroom without a second thought, but suddenly, around 4 a.m., I woke up, drenched in sweat and feeling incredibly thirsty. Since my room was right next to the kitchen, I figured I'd grab some cold water to cool off and help me go back to sleep. I quietly opened the fridge in the dark, trying not to wake up anyone. As I took a big gulp, I turned around, closing the bottle. That's when I froze. Right in front of me, only inches from my face, was a large black mass. I stood still, my heart racing, every hair on my body stood on end, and I couldn't move. For a moment I thought I'd gone blind, because this thing was close to my face. But I could still see through it. I could make out the streetlights through the shutters in the living room window. I tried to scream, but it was as if I was on mute, Panic surged through me, but I remained paralyzed. The thing didn't say a word or make a move. Suddenly, I dropped the bottle, and just like that, its hold on me loosened. I bolted into my room, sat on my bed, and stared at the doorway where the thing had been. 
It didn't follow me. It didn't cross the threshold. I stayed like that until somehow I fell asleep and woke up at 10 a.m. To my surprise, my grandparents had slept in, and I actually had to wake them up, which worried me a bit. On my way to their room, I saw the bottle still on the floor, proving to me this wasn't just a nightmare. Later in the afternoon, I called my dad and insisted that he find a way to bring me back to the city. I couldn't stay at this cottage anymore. I left that day at around 6 p.m. and never told anyone what happened. I kept it to myself. That figure still haunts my nightmares. In those dreams, it stands inches from my face, paralyzing me, leaving me waking up in a cold sweat and gasping for air. Right before Christmas that same year, my grandpa went out to the cottage by himself as he always did, to seal the place off for winter. He wanted to make sure nothing was damaged while the home was abandoned until next summer. But my grandpa never came back. They found him lying in the exact spot where I'd encountered that shadow. Ever since then, no one else has set foot inside that cottage. This was 18 years ago. I've spent a lot of time investigating what happened. I've asked many of the Bedouin natives in the area about these kinds of entities, but no one seems to have a clue what it was. They say some cottages out there were built where they weren't supposed to be, but beyond that, there are no answers. Why the Deer? From Please Stay. This story happened when I was six years old. I lived in a small town in southern Mississippi, and at the time, we lived on 246 acres of forest. In Mississippi, deer season is a big deal, and hunting is quite popular. That year, my dad was hunting from a tree stand at the edge of our property. As usual, being the curious one, I was up in the tree stand with him, reading some book about animals. Suddenly, a gunshot rang out. I looked up at my dad. He smiled and said, I just got a buck. Evidently, a deer had walked out, and I didn't see it because I was too engrossed in my book. A few minutes later, we climbed down from the stand and found blood in the grass, leading towards the trees. As it was getting dark, we decided to go back home to grab flashlights before heading back into the woods to track the deer. As we walked, we came to a thick patch of woods and had to army crawl under some branches. My dad decided to go one way, and I went the other. I was about 50 yards away from him when I found a piece of a shoulder bone covered in blood at the base of a tree. I thought this was strange, as deer don't usually lose bones when you shoot them. While I was examining this bone, I suddenly heard the snap of a twig. I searched with my flashlight in the direction of the sound. What I saw will forever be burned into my memory. Standing there was an 11 foot tall, gray, human shaped thing. It was dragging the lifeless body of the deer behind it. The creature didn't seem to notice me, and I didn't get a good look at its head. But I was terrified. I closed my eyes and began to cry. When I opened them, that thing was gone, leaving only a trail of blood leading deeper into the forest. About an hour later, my dad found me, still crying at the base of a tree. We never found that deer. That night, my dad took me home. I was silent the whole way, clinging to him on the four-wheeler, scared that whatever I had seen might come back for us. After doing some of my own research, I still have no idea what it was. But I believe it killed the deer, not the bullet. Since then, I've continued to hunt and fish, but I've developed a healthy respect for the woods, knowing that some things are better left alone. The creature I saw resembled a cryptid known as the Country Road Creature, but I'm not entirely sure. 
If you have any ideas about what this might have been, I'd love to hear them. I plan to share more stories in the future about my encounters with cryptids. I went back to that spot a few days ago, hoping to re-spark some old memories. I found some weird claw marks in the tree, so maybe whatever I saw that night is still out there. But I don't plan on finding out if it still roams those woods. Ever since that night, fewer and fewer deer have been coming by our house, I'm not sure if it's connected, but I have a feeling it might be. I'll keep you updated if anything else happens. Skinwalker Encounters From Boomhauer 22 To start this story, it involves multiple encounters. The first one happened when I was about 15 or 16 years old. I was with my cousin... We'll call him L for the story. It took place at my mom's house, out in the middle of nowhere, Illinois. We did have a few neighbors, along with my grandma and grandpa living next door, but they were about 300 yards away. One night at the beginning of winter, L was staying over with me. After a fun and tiring day, around midnight, we decided to go outside for a walk. We stepped out the door and sat down on the porch for a minute to put our shoes on. Once we got them on, we started walking down the driveway. We had taken about ten steps when Elle and I both looked towards my grandparents' house, seeing a figure run underneath the only streetlight. At first, we thought it was my grandma's dog, as that's what it looked like. But when it reached the road, it stood up on two legs and ran into the cornfield across the road. We turned to each other, and I was the first to speak. Did you see that? What the heck was it? I thought it was my grandma's dog, but it looked like it was standing on two legs. That's what I thought too, Elle replied. Realizing that whatever we had seen was not anything we could explain, we both bolted back into the house, nearly crashing into the door at the same time. Once inside... We locked every window and door in the house. There were a lot of windows, and then hid in my room for the rest of the night, with no further trouble. The next encounter happened a few years later, with my other cousin we'll call D. It was during deer season. D and I were hunting together as we usually did every year. We were sitting quietly, talking about who knows what, when a few deer came up. A couple of does and some small bucks, nothing big enough to shoot. While we watched them, suddenly a tall, skinny, rotting-looking figure appeared. It jumped onto one of the small bucks and took it down in moments, tearing it apart. We watched disturbed as the creature picked up the remains and carried them off. As it left, it made the most terrifying scream we'd ever heard. Once it was out of sight... D was the first to speak. Was that what I think it was? Yes, I replied. Yes, it was. At that time, we both knew about skinwalkers, but didn't fully believe in them. But after that day, we were quickly believers. The next story involves D again, and another cousin named L. Not the same L from the first story, though. This encounter took place in the woods around where we all lived. We set off to go coon hunting one night, leaving around 9.30pm. We arrived in the woods around 9.40. We brought two dogs with us and let them loose. After that, we stood around talking and playing on our phones. Suddenly, the dogs started to go haywire, which was unusual for them. D, L, and I grabbed our flashlights and set off into the woods. I had my 22, and D had his own. For those who don't know, the 22 is the best weapon for shooting raccoons out of trees. At that moment, I wished one of us had brought a bigger gun. As we ventured deeper into the woods, we started to hear a moaning sound, like someone being attacked. We all exchanged nervous glances. We knew no one else was supposed to be out here. Realizing we weren't alone, we sprinted towards the dogs, trying to figure out what was going on. 
As we got closer, we heard a long, high-pitched scream that stopped us all in our tracks. L eventually said, That didn't sound human. What was it? D and I looked at each other and replied, Skinwalker, as the two of us had both heard the same scream a few years prior. Since the dogs belonged to D, he wanted to go after them, to try to save them if he could. Al and I refused to let him go alone, so we all headed in together, lights on and guns ready. When we got to the clearing, we saw a tall, skinny, ragged, pale creature swiping at the dogs. The dogs managed to dodge each swipe, just in the nick of time. D and I aimed and started to shoot. My twenty-two was automatic, and D's was a single-shot rifle. I fired more shots, but my automatic only held ten bullets, and I was quickly out of ammo. As soon as I ran out, the thing turned towards us. I swear we heard it say, You all better run. Those words were all it took. We turned and ran at record speed through the woods. At some point, D tripped, and L and I stopped to help him up. The moment we turned around, we saw the figure of that thing running towards us, faster than we thought was possible. It moved in this weird, glitchy way, like a video game character lagging around. We booked it out of that forest, barely making it out alive. Somehow the dogs were right behind us. Once we were out in the clearing, we turned around and saw the tall creature standing at the edge of the woods, staring at us. We stood there, frozen, for what felt like several minutes. Then it turned and let out the same blood-curdling scream we'd heard earlier. We wasted no time loading the dogs into the truck and speeding away. None of us said a word the entire ride home. We were too out of breath, too shaken up. Our minds raced, trying to grasp how we all made it out alive, and how the dogs had too. None of us even had a scratch, but we all knew that we shouldn't have made it out. Thanks for stopping by our little campsite here at Outdoor Terrors. To hear your story on the show, send it to us at darkstories.org. For more scary stories from me, catch me on my other podcasts, Unexplained Encounters, and Tales from the Break Room on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Or go to eeriecast.com for those and even more terrifying podcasts. Follow me on X or Twitter at Dark Prevails. And if you don't mind, leave a rating for Outdoor Terrors on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Till next time, I'll see you soon when the campfire blazes once again.